we have quite a lot of people signed up today, so I'm just gonna give them all a minute to to get in. Yeah. Get their high quality headphones set up. <laughs> There's an echo. One second. Should I mute? Eight to three, eight to three. Apparently, there's a there's an echo. The only echo well, that I heard was the one that uh, Torben uh, added when he said one two three one two three. I think that's uh, artificial. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. So I think if it's just Muriel that can hear the echo, I think we will start. Yes, welcome everyone to this Danish Sound Cluster webinar. The subject today is artificial intelligence in audio signal processing, and we have three uh, local experts for you. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Sign Cluster is, um, has been put in place to support and, and strengthen the audio industry in Denmark and the, the approximately 500 companies who are part of that landscape. And uh, yeah, we do activities like this, this kind of event for knowledge sharing and, and uh, yeah, to support the industry. Um, so before we start, I'll go through a couple of practical things. We have a chat and a Q&A chat. So if you have just general feedback and comments, you can write it in the chat. And if you have questions for our speakers, then you can put it in the Q&A. Excuse me. <laughs> um, our first speaker today is Torben Christiansen. He is the Director of Technology at APOS. And he works um, with all of the companies in the demand group to really uh, leverage and extract all the good technology and research and, and get it into products. And today he's going to uh, give us an introduction to AI in audio signal processing. So thanks a lot for being here, Torben. Yeah, thanks to, uh, for allowing me to be here. So uh, I'll just uh, fire up, uh, let's see if you can see the, the screen. Yes, we can. Is, Looks good. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, I have been the honor, given the honor to uh, give an introduction into the AI world. I'll I'll do it a little bit, uh, very high level, because the real experts are Clement and uh, Nils Henrik von Tobedan here. So, so uh, I'll try to see if I can do it short, and then hand it over to the to the people going deeper. So and their questions are of course very welcome in the in the chat. We will take them. So um, just about me, I'm from a tech, a Danish Technical, Technical University, Director of Technology here at EPOS, and I have been in the demand organization uh, a long time, 21 years. So, so uh, and it has been a fantastic journey and ultra short, we have existed since uh, 2003 and we are located in uh, Ballorp in the Copenhagen area. Um, and then uh, ultra short fly in on, on the uh, why do we talk? Why is AI at all interesting today? And, and it is because AI is, AI, AI is uh, claimed to be following some of the most uh, uh, interesting uh, moves uh, through history in terms of moving technology forward, uh, information society and all this. So you all know uh, Moore's law and then we have kind of a law. I don't I'm not sure if it is a law, but Metcalfe's law is about uh, the number of connection points that you have. The more points that are connected, the more intelligence that you have, the more uh, knowledge you can pull out of it. And then uh, it is the, um, I mean, this is coming from uh, IBM. So, so they call it Watson's law. And that is that if you then add AI to this, you can actually outgrow, I mean, you can you can it goes even faster than 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 we have seen so far and i think the ones of you who have been uh, close to exponential growth uh, knows that that if you look back then you can see a certain type of development and then you you look forward and see when will this and this hit me it will come faster than you can imagine we are not exponential in our minds so so this is 
just uh, to be aware that what we talk about today, what we can see today uh, about pitfalls and what is the challenges, etc., they may be solved faster <laughs> than we can imagine. Uh, but we, we will try today to outline some of the, the challenges that we have working with AI within the audio industry. Uh, so just another one is my own pictures, again, IBM. <laughs> but uh, I went to Zurich where they have a, a huge, uh, very professional research lab. They also have a, a prototype of a quantum computer there. And I actually don't know if that will play a role into uh, AI world. It, it will come in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. And here you calculate on, on the movements in, in atoms. And that they have not even invented the programming language yet. But all of a sudden, it will be here, and maybe it can also do something for AI. Maybe not being AI, maybe teaching AI. But at least what we were pitched down there is that if this comes through and they can build enough of the qubits, which is the, the one to the left, is, is what uh, it's a part of the system. And if you have a certain amount of these, you have a qubit. And then if you have, I can't remember, 20 qubits, you, you have a system that can, if one airplane is delayed, you can actually within minutes uh, reschedule all airplanes on the whole Earth to, so that you don't get delays. So it's really, really powerful, this system. So this will come in the future. Now we'll return a little bit uh, down on Earth again. So we were now out of space. Now we go into audio. And audio is a little bit different from uh, from the rest. Now I've just put up uh, some, some product categories that we have here. But uh, one common thing here is that all of these products that that we, for example, do in EPOS and I, I, Jabra has a similar products, they all have uh, the need to pick up uh, our own voice and uh, clear away uh, disturbing noise uh, around us. And this is actually what, what I will give you an example of today. When we work with audio here in, uh, in, um, in uh, EPOS, it's, there's many things to it. And uh, the classic way of, of treating audio is about, uh, it goes into the ear, the ear uh, transformed it into a neural code. And then we have some psychoacoustics that is this good audio? Do we have masking effects in MP3 and all these kind of things? But the new, the new stuff is of course that, uh, that it all ends in our brain. And in our brain, we need to find a way, we need to orient in this audio where, 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 who, who should I listen to right now? Who is uh, interesting? And once we then have this, we can uh, put it into the focus mode and then we focus on, on, on what is said. And uh, by doing this, all, all this, the right thing, uh, we can actually measure on people that if we do it the right way, they don't use so much efforts uh, in their brain to do the job. And that means for in our segments, if you are a gamer, and you would like to win the game, if I can own, unload your brain 5%, well, then you will win the game. At least it is like that in the Olympics. If I can help the 100 meter runner with 5% extra, they will win the race. It's, it's almost uh, doping. So, uh, but uh, the, the world is not uh, uh, ideal. So you have a lot of good, uh, uh, a lot of things that will disturb this orientation so that your brain has to work harder. It can be noise around you. It can be that the speech is not clear, distortion of signals, bad frequency response, spatial audio. And I'm pretty sure uh, if we pull together the knowledge that you have out there in this community, you can, you can find many more reasons why the audio will not be perceived uh, well. So uh, a classical, uh, cl classical uh, uh, methods of then trying to uh, reduce these artifacts is to have uh, to block out the noise, to have uh, noise cancelling, to make a proper speaker so that the signal into ears are well, and the other way around to the microphone that you actually do some uh, fantastic acoustic design around the microphone. You do some beam forming or some zooming in on the mouth if you're uh, far away uh, and you add noise reduction algorithms. And then uh, why did, <laughs> now it jumped the wrong way. Okay, so now it's with, not with Intel inside, but it's with AI inside. So that is the new stuff. So I'll just give you an example of what we have done in EPOS, uh, very, very high level and not go deep. And then I'll pass you on. So deep learning again, uh, for, for the ones that are not knowing is that, I mean, we call the AI, it's a neural networks, blah, blah, blah. Everything is, uh, you can say, inspired from the structure of the brain, how our brain is working. And actually there's so many similarities. So it's not, it's not totally wrong. Um, 
So if you see uh, what, what are you when you grow up, your brain when you are b- uh, born, you ha- you can do something. You can breathe. You can uh, you know where the food is, uh, and you can get it out of your body again. But but. You, you don't know so much, but then you grow up, you have some great teachers in the beginning, it's your parents, then it will be teachers at school, et cetera, et cetera. And they will teach you stuff to do. It could be that you could ride a bike. It could be uh, roller skates, uh, et cetera. Uh, but what you are not taught, you, you don't learn and you cannot master, at least for some of the things. So if you don't learn uh, Russian uh, language, you cannot understand Russian language. So, so somebody has to teach you and somebody has to tell your brain if you are doing a good job. And actually, if you adapt that to uh, AI, then you just have a computer with a lot of cells, uh, call it deep neural networks, depending on how big it is. And then all these cells are uh, day one, uh, they are just blank, no information inside. So now you need to feed it with data, evaluate if it does a good job and then adjust it. And then in the end, you will have a neural network that can solve a certain task. So that is actually just the fundamentals. If we talk about audio, then, I mean, I, and, and now we talk about the voice pickup. Uh, the target is uh, what is said. So it's very, very simple. What I'm telling you right now should uh, be, uh, there should be no reverb from the room. There should be no uh, disturbance from the other side. So it's very, very clear what the target is. It has to be picked up by a microphone, but the disturbance that is, it can be many, many different things. So if I do a training, to remove disturbance from uh, the target audio, which is uh, my own voice. And I only trained it in a party situation where everybody is partying, loud music, etc. Well, then maybe it will not do so good if I sit in a quiet office and do my job there and then some other kinds of disturbance will come. So in order to uh, train a neural network to do something within uh, audio, you have to present it to many different uh, sources of, of uh, disturbances uh, and actually also many different sources of, uh, of the target voice. Um, so it's, it's, now it's, it starts getting a little bit uh, complicated. Then I have a, before we then go deep into what did we do here at EPOS, uh, I would just let you know my most boring slide and I, I will improve over time. I need some pictures here. I just need allowance to put the right pictures in, but Imaging is mostly about classification. That means that you recognize what is in the picture, how many me- uh, people are in the meeting room, uh, maybe uh, what is their intention, what are they doing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, AI on imaging has come very, very far. So very often when people talk about ah AI, we all need AI and we can just do it, and there's so much knowledge. Yes, maybe in imaging, but in audio, we are uh, lacking. Uh, behind. We need to do more research. We need a lot more work to done. We need more data. We need all of it. And I'm sure Clement and uh, Nils Henrik will maybe come back and touch base on this. Audio is not about classification. Audio is more about regression. It's about restoring bad audio. It's it's uh, re- removing uh, data. So it's you cannot say it's not classification at all, but but at least it's, it's, a, it's another different uh, type of problem. And that means that the the brain, the, the neural network you structure around it, it has a different nature and, and you have to train it differently. And actually one of, the, um, one of the challenges that we at least have here in EPOS and by talking to Clement is also that working on a good uh, loss function, what is, how to train it, how to reward this network, that is not trivial. What is good audio? That is a uh, uh, thing. And now we come to something where I normally <laughs> fail is to share audio over uh, over uh, the network here. So let's see if it works. So what I prepared for you is what can typically go, go wrong? And I just, I, I didn't just take it, you know, something that I know is, is bad. Uh, I, I actually took some of the most used app, one of the most used app in, in the whole world is at least by users. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then let's see how that works on a certain task. So we have, I have four files and I, I have to play them all the way. So it's uh, 10 seconds each or 13. First, I will play what is the target sound? What is the audio that you would like to have in the end? Then I mix it with a uh, white noise, which is a very artificial noise source. You hardly hear it out in the world. Then I put in some pop noise and then you can hear how it uh, is doing on pop noise. And in the end, 
I will have a, a, a female distractor, we call it. So a person sitting a, a small meter, 60 centimeter away from you talking. And then when I'm talking in my head, said, I don't want that uh, this lady is getting through my microphone. Imagine you are in a bank, you are sitting next to each other, and then you are revealing personal information about CPR number, uh, income, or whatever problem you have. I don't want the neighbor client to hear that. That would be a disaster. So I'll play them now. And each file, uh, each file of these uh, last three, you will hear. Uh, you will hear that we, we start out with doing nothing. How would it sound if we didn't apply the AI? Then we turn it on, off, on, off, on, and you can clearly hear when it's off and on. Um, yeah, so let's try to go through it, and then you can see uh, it. I can promise you it will get harder and harder. That's why it's built up like this. Let's see. The jacket hung on the back of the wide chair. A pound of sugar costs more than eggs. The coffee stand is too high for the couch. The ship was torn apart on the sharp reef. That was the original sound. Then we just mix it with uh, white noise. The jacket hung on the back of the wide chair. A pound of sugar costs more than eggs. The coffee stand is too high for the couch. The ship was torn apart on the sharp reef. A pretty good job. I mean, that is really good. Uh, you could actually end there if that was the whole world. The jacket hung on the back of the wide chair. A pound of sugar costs more than eggs. The coffee stand is too high for the couch. The ship was torn apart on the sharp reef. Yeah, so now you can ha hear that the system is working harder. It's not perfect anymore. It actually did, does a good job of removing the noise, but the noise is sounding a little bit more artificial and also the own voice is heard and we don't want that. So let's hear how it goes when we put a German into the picture. The jacket hung on the back of the wide chair. A pound of sugar costs more than eggs. The coffee stand is too high for the couch. The ship was torn apart on the sharp reef. That's not good. We cannot have that. Kühl und klar ist die Luft. Nein, danke. We don't want, in this case, the German to speak into our microphones. And, and if we have systems like this, we cannot sell our products and then leave it like that because we will get a lot of complaints about it's not working so so uh, right i would claim that today we don't have a solution out there that you can just turn on and then it's a single channel in the black box out of with clean speeds and everybody will be happy but it's clearly that if your use case is that you are never nearby anybody who is talking and you can live with a few artifacts and you are walking around out there well then it does something good and I can promise you, this is one of the big ones. And they have the money also to do research in the future. So they will just improve. Uh, and uh, our analysis so far is just that we also have to do something. Because we are not always connected to the same of the big ones or to the same ecosystem. And our products, our customers, they expect us to work uh, you know, everywhere with all systems. Yes. The jacket hung on oh. the back of the wide chair. The jacket oh, hung, the jacket, the jacket, the jacket hung on the back of the wide chair. Wide chair. Oh, the the coffee stand, stand, stand is too high. high. The coffee yeah. stand. This is a classic one. Can I go on? Yes. How do we do that? Yeah, OK. Good. I survived. I don't know why I didn't jump on. So uh, so right now, what it is, just to pin it out, uh, 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 voice could look like this. Voice is, you have to train with language, with age. With vocal efforts, if you're talking like this, or if you are only talking about this, if you are male or if you are female, how loud you talk, etc. So you can imagine it's not trivial to test one system that is working in all of the world. Then you have the sound. You have seen all the different cases before. You can just imagine how many days. I can promise you there's infinite. So you will never be ending training it. So you need a clever way of sampling these audio uh, things, uh, audio files, and do the right of uh, the training. You mix them up, you get something like this. What is the task? You have to clean it up and get back to the clear voice. This is extremely simple. So in our product that is shown in the picture, the ADAPT 660, uh, uh, what did we do in that? Well, we didn't have the computer power to put in AI in that system embedded and then just uh, audio in and clean uh, voice out. This, this is today not possible. So we use AI in a, in a different way. So we have speech, we have some voice pickup, 
it will be gathered through an acoustical lens, a beamformer that is zooming in on what is interesting by the mouth. We remove echo, it's uh, not uh, nice. Then we put on some noise reduction that is doing some clever tricks to remove noise. And then out we get almost clean speech. So what we have found out is that if we put a layer of AI on top and then controlling all the parameters down in the system, and then there is some combinations of these parameters that we cannot adjust from the factory side. And even if it's adaptive, it, we have adjusted it in a way where we will not end out there and do something against this because it would have a penalty on sound quality somewhere else. So we put on top this AI and if this AI overlooking the whole scene can say, okay, we have to do this, then it's like having a sound, our sound engineer in, inside the product and then do a tweak like that. So it, it, it will do something in some cases, um, but not uh, all over. Many times it will be the simple, the, the classic uh, system, which is not simple, but <laughs> it's classic. It will do the job and then we use AI to improve it. So it's a, a tiny, a small step to get started, but, but we have to be robust. We have to know what we are doing. So it's better to start small and then scale it along the way. And then the, the computer inside the, the headset, uh, there is coming a new generation right now here next year, together with uh, together with Bluetooth LE Audio, there will be much more horsepower inside, much more uh, uh, memory. So the, the future looks bright that what we can do in the future with that respect. Uh, da, da, yeah, it looks like this. So you have the signal, it comes in, you make a, a spectrogram of it. Then you have uh, this network to overlook it. It's a little bit simplified this, uh, then you get the clean speeds out. So uh, that it's just an example of it. And it's not the network alone doing everything. So it's just how it could look like. Yeah. Yeah, then uh, we would like to brag a little bit because this very small step that we did here, uh, we claim at least for the voice cleanup that 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 we have it embedded in the signal path of cleaning up voice. We we are the first in the world doing that for the UC space. Um, but it's a small step, and and uh, every everybody will do it in the near future, and then it will grow from there. And if you list, if you hear out there somebody saying, "Yeah, we do AI in our product," everybody will claim that. Uh, sometimes it's only to recognize Alexa or, or Cortana. Other, uh, other times it is to clean up uh, the signal uh, when you have a speech in. Uh, ju just ask, what is the AI used for? And then you will get uh, to know. AI is also used uh, uh, yeah, for other stuff. It could also be on the speaker path for ANC. I, uh, we have somebody among us today who's doing that. And that is also a very interesting uh, part. Yeah. Come to, coming to an end very uh, fast. Well, today we work on being understood. Uh, very soon you, we will try to do this so that it fits to the personal user use case. You could imagine that if you, if this system is not learning inside the product, it's it's far too complicated to do that. So the learning is in the cloud. We do the learning, put it into the product. So if you had an app and you said, well, I'm a male or I'm a female, maybe the two networks that you would put in is different. And then you can choose your preferred network. That is a very, very simple uh, case of doing it. And then you can just think from there, how could I personalize this? And then in the end, it could also be um, uh, even more like a fin fingerprint. Who are you? Uh, how are you? Are you stressed? Uh, what are you up to? So. I think when you get down to the last one, it, it goes like this, and then GDPR and security about um, uh, about uh, personal data, etc., comes into the play. Yeah, that was actually the last slide I have on on uh, on this topic. And now <laughs> I I cannot see the the question field, etc. So Shelly, you need to help me if if uh, there is some questions. But else, I would like to hand over to Clement. So what do you say, Shelley? Thank you very much, Torben. Uh, there aren't any questions right now, but. Cool, it was totally not understandable. So thank you. No, it was very <laughs> clear. I had a question. Yeah. Uh, why do you think we're so behind with audio? Is it because it's a more complex task or there just hasn't been a focus on it as early as on the image side? It is actually, uh, I, I think that 
imaging in the beginning has been a little bit, I mean, it, it easy, and maybe there were some needs there that you you started there. If you look at the virtual reality, then then all the work has been done to get the the bandwidth and the the vision up to the to the glasses, and they tended totally to forget the immersive audio that you need as well. So now the immersive audio side is picking up and it's it's a very important contribution. So I don't know, maybe Clement and, and Nils Hendrik knows more about why they started on, on images. Uh, I just know it's it's easier to get data. It's easier to to check what is uh, how many cats is, is there in the picture. And then you have people counting. You put the right uh, metadata on the side and then you know exactly there was five data, five cats in the picture. There's no doubt. But is this good audio or is this good audio? Yeah. Even a, Mos a Moscow will not tell you the answer. Yeah, I see. I see. It's it's more subjective. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We actually have a couple of questions here. Oh, what is UC certification from Sean ah. Nielsen? Yeah, sorry for that. So UC is unified communication. So so our product lines are for the enterprise solution and for gaming. And in enterprise, uh, in enterprise, you have a unified connect uh, communication. It's uh, Microsoft Teams. Uh, so it is. Uh, uh, an ecosystem where you can go to your computer and if somebody calls on teams you have i mean you can push your headset and then you you uh, uh yeah you are into the into the dial i don't think i don't have it with zoom right now i have with teams i have some products there's a teams button also on the product i can just push the button and i'm in the meeting so it's professional communication in in in, in companies it's not uh me as a user privately back home listening to music yeah okay and from anonymous what do you to be an i think we're missing a word to be an enabling technology to improve the smart capability of audio devices what the enabling you... mm. uh, for for our for for our i mean we have many different products we have also video products where you have a a, a big computer inside but for for a headset, for example, I need more memory and more processing power. And then we need to find some ways in the future how to build these systems so that you also can personalize them. How can you, how can you train them out there? I mean, we are not so clever as a company that we can predict the perfect, the perfect network for, for everyone. <laughs> there is not one fits all, I guess. So then you have to do uh, many compromises. So. I think uh, enabling technology for me would be uh, ultra low power systems with more horsepower and more memory. Okay. We can, re we can repeat the question if you can remember later when uh, Clement and Ms. Hemmerich is, they can also answer it. Maybe they have different needs for their applications. Yeah. Possibly. Okay. And, and sorry, uh, data, of course, access to data. And, and this is really, really hard. There's a community also here in Denmark uh, recording data that can be used to train such systems on. And, and, uh, and we are part of that one. So hopefully soon we'll get a lot of audio data that we can test on. Yeah. And that's just within, the, within Denmark. It is, uh, yes, it is uh, in the industry in Denmark who has signed up to pay part of that bill and it's uh, made by force technology and then uh, and then it's shared among these uh, companies. Yes, I don't know the, the, the rule and, and laws about it if, if other companies outside can get access to it. I, to my knowledge, it's the one contributing with money and people to do the recordings, they also get access to them afterwards. Yeah. Okay, and next question. Why will LE Audio make AI possible in the future? Yeah, the, it's a good question. It's because in order to bring LE Audio, which is a Bluetooth wireless technology, to the market, you have to do new radios, new chipsets. And when they do that, they have access to the latest and greatest uh, uh, um, silicon technology, the latest and greatest DSPs, et cetera. So by okay. implementing LE Auto, they also have, they make a new chip so they can take the latest generation of, of everything and put it into to it. And therefore it, it's enabling. It's not the LE Audio. It's just in the Bluetooth world that is coming next. Yeah. Thank you. Is it possible to bring AI and speech recognition to DAWs for creators? What other use case can can it be helpful for in the software domain? 
Ooh. I need the first part again. How can it help? Is it possible to bring AI and speech recognition to D DAW's digital audio workstations? I suppose it means like for journalists or podcasters, people who perhaps aren't so skilled in the audio domain, um, but they're working a lot with speech and they want to have some kind of automatic speech enhancement. Yeah, I, actually, I was also asked about that when we had the tech barbecue. I made a short presentation there as well, and there was some some skilled persons in linguistic, etc., and they asked about this. And I think the single podcaster cannot do something uh, him or herself. Uh, there, there will come some systems for them. It could be that if you are a podcaster and you are sitting in a small room like this, you would like to remove the rework, and then you have some 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 plugins for that. Uh, it could also be, um, it could also be. Uh, I know in the gaming industry there are systems that is uh, counting uh, if you are uh, saying bad words, if you say the f word too many times, it gives you a notification that hey, you don't swear so much. You, you it's not good for your podcast, etc. I don't know if that answers the question. It's it's uh, there will come there will come many tools access that that you as a podcaster have access to, but you have to go out and find them and then define what you want. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure a lot of other applications. I know that uh, Martin Brandstrup from TV2 is in the, the audience today, and he's been talking a lot about uh, dubbing costs, and they spend eighty percent of the the budget in re-recording uh, speech afterwards because the recording wasn't good enough and it takes so much time and it's very expensive uh, so why is this technology not not there yet like you say it's so so far behind the, yeah. the image technology i think uh, money 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 so the uh, i mean the where does the money flow and and it has been easier to show uh, and prove effects and get money out of uh, recognizing how many cats there is in the picture it's not further than that. It will also come to the pro segment. I guess it's already in the pro segment, but it is then 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 it then you are the teacher. You have to teach what is it that you want the network to do for you because it could be slightly different from what 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 I wanted to do. So it will come and um, yeah, eventually. Yeah. Okay, let's take one last question and then we should jump to the next one. This is from Georgios. Why did you prefer traditional spectrograms versus MEL spectrograms? Ah, uh, that's maybe a little bit too deep for me. I'm not a, <laughs> an, uh, an audio expert. MEL, is that because you have it is split in uh, more octaves or what is, uh, sorry for not remembering. It's more than 20 years since I, I had that in school. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know either. Hey, Nils, Henrik, can you help me? Do you know? Yes. Oh, uh, okay. So uh, the mill, the mill frequency scale. That's a, so you have a frequency resolution that uh, mimics more the frequency resolution of the ear. So yeah, yeah. Have, it's more like the uh, one third octave uh, filtering, yeah. and usually, um, usually we do not use that because all of our uh, um, signal paths and our filter banks are, are linear spaced filter banks because that's what we can make uh, most uh, efficiently and then we have the same latency across uh, each uh, frequency at least for some of our uh, companies there are others where male frequencies would be uh, more applicable but uh, the signal processing uh, pathway in, in demand that has been uh, linear filter banks for um, a couple of decades but I think we, if you take it a high a, a number a, a level higher, then of course uh, we treat how we hear and how is how is signal correlated. They are correlated in very few bands at the low frequencies, but in the, at the higher frequencies, there's a, a higher correlation in terms of how we perceive the audio. So that is that is actually incorporated on top of it. So uh, right, yeah. So it was not uh, the to answer the question. Also, it it. it it's it's not uh, the spectrogram in here is just me trying to show a picture. It's not uh, me trying to educate exactly how should the spectrogram spectrogram be. It's it's more symbolic. Yeah. Okay. But then uh, if that was the last question, then maybe it's over to Clement. That is correct. Or are we going to Nils next? Oh, Clement. Sorry. Take over. <clears throat> 
Clément, welcome. Clément is a senior research scientist in the audio research group at Jabra, and he has a PhD in computer science, signal processing, and machine learning from Telecom Paris. And today he's going to speak to us about a data-driven algorithm for speech enhancement. So thanks for being here, Clément. Yes, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, thanks for the yes. introduction. Um, yeah, so I will do a, a presentation on, on uh, speech enhancement. Uh, speech enhancement is a very large uh, topic, um, and uh, maybe it's a misuse of the of the word. But I will uh, I will mo more focus on on uh, denoising or let's say uh, deep noise suppression. So let's uh, jump right uh, into it. So I will I will use a lot during the, this presentation the terms uh, DNS or deep noise suppression and and DNS refer to uh, to machine learning techniques that used to eliminate or reduce noise or background uh, sounds in order to improve speech quality. It can be for humans uh, as it's happening, for example, right now in, in the, this meeting. If, if there was a lot of noise in the, in the streets outside, uh, Zoom would try to uh, denoise the signal. Or it can also be uh, used by uh, Amazon, for example, in their Amazon Echo, uh, trying to understand uh, what people are saying to their devices. Uh, so straight into it, uh, we, we we build a very simple uh, voice pickup uh, model uh, where it's a, it's a single microphone, and and we are we are interested in in the. In the, in the signal at the microphone. So there will be uh, some noise source in the, in the room. So here I've, I have two, but it can be more, it can be also uh, ambient noise. And the, the noise from the, so there will be an impulse response from the noise source to the microphone. Uh, that would be uh, just sound propagation, a way to model sound propagation. Uh, there is also an uh, impulse response or transfer function, let's say from the mouth of the user to the microphone. Uh, in the case of headset, like I'm wearing right now, uh, the impulse response or transfer function is actually, you know, doesn't have a, a big influence and is almost uh, negligible for, for headset. Uh, however, you can imagine if you are trying to uh, to make a system for a speakerphone device that uh, that's going to sit at, in a table and that's going to try to pick up the voice of uh, many user in a room where you have reverb and echo and noise, etc. Then it, it, uh, it it's uh, actually absolutely crucial to have this uh, this transfer function. There are also some uh, other factors that uh, I'm not listing here, but I can cite a few, uh, like uh, microphone sensitivity. Uh, each of the microphones used in our device are not uh, perfect, and they don't follow the same uh, response curve, uh, frequency response curve. And also, uh, for example, the acoustic uh, of a device, if you place a microphone inside a, inside a device, uh, there will be some interaction between the, let's say, the, the acoustics, uh, like the, just the mechanic, uh, how the device is built. So there are uh, yeah, a lot of Lot of parameters here, but we can make a, the model very simple by just uh, just this equation here, where it will be uh, the sound of the microphone will be the, the speech of the user related by an impulse response and and the noise that will be an ambient noise. Uh, this problem is very important for many of the big players, so you know Google, uh, Microsoft, uh, Zoom, and and uh, Skype, uh, Microsoft again, um, because uh, they are very interested in this software, purely software-based uh, noise reduction. Uh, when when we are in Teams or in a Zoom meeting right now, for example, the Zoom only has access to uh, to mono stream uh, from from all the different uh, users, so so they 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 cannot do much more than than this. So it's a single microphone denoising. It's also a very very popular topic in the literature. Uh, if you look on Google Scholar, there are many, many papers on that. And, and let's say every year at the big conferences, uh, ICASP, Interspeech, you have dozens, if not hundreds of papers that uh, that comes out on this particular topic. So it's a, it's a, yeah, there's a extensive uh, literature on that. Um, so to talk a little bit about Jabra, uh, what we do. So we, of, of course, have a very diverse uh, range of product uh, from uh, call centric devices for workers that, uh, that use them in, in call center, uh, eight hour days, that's, you know, their job to be on the phone. So they have, let's say, you know, high requirements for uh, voice quality, uh, speech quality. Then from uh, office workers uh, that use their devices for meetings, for seminar like that, of course, uh, people uh, on the move, uh, in their car, in their truck. Uh, so there is a, a wide variety of product. And, and also, let's not forget about the consumer products, uh, which are mostly used for music, but they have some capability of uh, taking calls. So it's, it's really a, a wide variety of product with uh, let's say also different use cases. So it's very important to keep that in mind. Um, 
And so, well, how different is the signal from this? Uh, how different is the signal picked up by these different devices? So I, I made a very, very simple uh, simulation. Sorry for the all the experts here that will think it's absolutely uh, obvious, but uh, I'll do it anyway. Um, so let's compare three uh, different devices from the, the portfolio. Um, one with a long boom arm, so let's say the microphone is very close to the mouth. One with a short boom arm, where the, the microphone is a little bit further away, and and one with the, the microphone directly in the ear, so quite far away from the mouth. Uh, we know from uh, propagation of of uh, say a sound wave in air that uh, as soon as you double the distance, you lose a six dB. So let's just just as a very simple example, let's listen to the to the audio uh, of the of how it would sound like as a reference for on the when you have the microphone close to the mouse. And the people sought to overthrow the government. Then Napoleon was called on to protect the palace of the Tuileries, where the offices of the French government were located. Nice gentleman uh, explaining about the Napoleon story. And then how it sounds when it's uh, further away, so on the on these uh, earbuds. And the people sought to overthrow the government. Then Napoleon was called on to protect the palace of the Tuileries, where the offices of the French government were located. So it's very easy. It's just a simple reducing the volume. So the sound is picked up uh, quieter. So that's that very simple. So let's say we have a six dB of decrease from going to a microphone close to the mouth to a short boom arm. And we have uh, around 12 dB. Uh, don't quote me on these numbers, but that, that would be the sort of, of numbers you would get. Um, however, if you're sitting in a noisy environment, the noise will be picked up equally uh, by the devices. Uh, uh, so yeah, so the noise will sound basically the same in all three cases. What's important in our case is that we, we have to normalize the speech so that uh, all the speech of all the different devices at the same level, which means that, uh, let's say, well, in the in the case of the, of the small uh, earbuds, we will have to crank up the gain quite a bit, and it will, uh, it will of course, sound more noisy, even though it's been recorded in the same environment. So let's listen to the first headset and uh, the, the earbuds to, see, to hear the difference in, in noise level. And the people sought to overthrow the government. Then Napoleon was called on to protect the palace of the Tuileries, where the offices of the French government were located. And let's listen to the earbuds. And the people sought to overthrow the government. Then Napoleon was called on to protect the palace of the Tuileries, where the offices of the French government were located. So you can hear a massive difference in noise level. Um, and it's also uh, important to note that uh, these small form factors uh, they, they have uh, less compute, so the chipset inside are, let's say, they, yeah, smaller, less space. They have also less batteries, so it's, uh, it makes you know, a double problem. It's, uh, not only it's more difficult task just because of the acoustics on where the microphone is placed, but it's also a more difficult task because the devices have uh, high, like stricter requirements in terms of, of battery consumption, et cetera. So you know, it, it's why you know, when, you had, when you have meeting with your Apple uh, AirPods, uh, sometimes it's not the best audio quality for, for the people, uh, not bashing on Apple or anything, but just, just for people's information. So well, now how how does this uh, audio look? So sorry again for the expert, uh, but I think it's quite interesting to to go through that. Uh, this would be an example of an uh, let's say a, a waveform of, of speech, a sample at sixteen uh, kilohertz. So it's it's a wide band uh, standard. It's what's used in in our device in telephony most of the time. Uh, so usually it's it's a little bit difficult to process directly the the waveform. Uh, it's, it's usually better to, to compute what we call features, to dissect the signal, uh, to, to understand better what, what's inside. Uh, so what we usually do is that we uh, create, a, we, we sequence uh, the signal in, in smaller overlapping windows. And on these, uh, these smaller frames, we compute the Fourier transform. Uh, this will give us some uh, power spectrum. And this power spectrum will just basically explain to us uh, how much uh, amplitude, let's say, how much power is at each of the frequency in, in, this, uh, in this window. When we do that, we can uh, take the other overlapping window, do the FFT again, rinse and repeat, uh, and stack all these frames to create the spectrograms that we all know and love. Um, so this is, uh, let's say, this is an important step because, let's say, this data is what the neural network will see. So all the 
parameter of the of the Fourier transform are very important. So, say when you when you think about uh, frame size, when you think about overlap uh, window, etc. So all these parameters are very important to um, to the yeah. Let's say when you when you want to do this, this sort of processing. All right. Uh, so let's say to explain a little bit the main technique that we are using in, in, in Jabra to do AI denoising is uh, let's say from the from the noisy speech we'll send this noisy speech to the neural network and the neural network will will process it and we try to estimate uh, what you know filters uh, that that would work for all users and that, that, that should, yeah that should uh, perform well in all conditions this uh, these filters can be many things so let's say depend on the application again you've seen that uh, each uh, device is a very different range of, of usage so we, we cannot have one solution that fits all but it can be a wide variety of things like a voice probability a complex ratio etc and uh, this uh, this filter will be applied on the noisy spectrogram to create an enhanced uh, output um, it's, uh, it's, it's also very important that, of course, it's uh, real-time capable. So what we mean by that is uh, we need this uh, algorithmic uh, latency to be uh, below 40 milliseconds. Um, why do we have this constraint? Is uh, uh, The maximum latency allowed in team is around 120 milliseconds. So when we have the latency of algorithmic latency both ways, it's, uh, let's say, around 80 plus some codec latency, network latency, et cetera. So we cannot exceed this uh, 40 milliseconds. So we need to be uh, quite fast. Uh, of course, we cannot look in the future too, too much. We have to be uh, real-time uh, capable. Um, and uh, and they, they need to work with a small chipset. Uh, so let's say, to, to, to quote a few, few numbers uh, here, um, let's say state-of-the-art uh, chipset uh, right now are able to, to produce or to yeah uh, give allows us around uh, five uh, billions of operation per second and per milliwatt. So it's uh, let's say you can run significant amount of neural network uh, in there, but it's still uh, let's say these these neural network are very compute intensive and and then if you talk about memory. Uh, footprint and memory bandwidth. This is a whole different topic. So it's, it's still very important to uh, miniaturize these uh, these, uh, these systems. And um, a few more details on this uh, on this denoising is that we are interested in two uh, main mechanisms. So one is what we call a broadband uh, VA. VAT-like denoising, where we will try to, uh, let's say, remove noise when uh, when speech is uh, is not active, when you are not talking. We try to remove noise in this uh, in these regions, and this is relatively easy to do. Uh, as it's, let's say, with quotation mark again, depend on the conditions. It's it's fairly easy to detect if uh, the user is speaking or not. Um, however, when, when the speaker is active and is sitting in background in a, in a noisy environment, uh, you also have to reduce the noise uh, in between the harmonics. Uh, and, and this is a much more difficult uh, thing to do as you have to be extremely accurate in your prediction of these filters in order to prevent artifacts. You don't want to create artifacts. You don't want to uh, destroy the, the, the voice as, let's say, most user would almost prefer to listen to someone in, in background noise and uh, someone with a lot of artifacts in their voice. So it's it's very important to be very precise there. And uh, yes, we, we talked a little bit about this uh, link between uh, images and, uh, and audio. So the similarity I can draw here is that, uh, well, we are trying to do some sort of segmentation. So uh, what you have on top is an image of, of a road and uh, let's say, uh, what what, uh, what you would like to do if you uh, if you're building an autom autonomous vehicle, for example, is to classify what uh, each of the pixels are. So you want to classify well uh, these pixels are, are road, so it's, it's going to be orange. This is like sidewalk. Uh, this is grass. This is the sky, etc. And, and you want to classify uh, each of the pixels of the of the image. Um, it's it's uh, well a little, little bit similar in, in our case. So we have a spectrogram input of, of noisy speech, and we want to classify each of the time frequency bin into well, is it speech or is it noise? Um, but as I explained earlier, we, we have to we have to do it in real time. So we cannot just have a big oh, sorry, we cannot have just a big chunk of spectrogram like that and and process it and get the output. We have to do it uh, frame by frame. So it needs to be so the data is is organized a little bit in a, in a different way. And and maybe the issue and just to come back to the discussion we had earlier, maybe the issue is that we are using networks that are built for 
image processing in, in uh, audio and that's why we are having problems but we are trying to improve and we can still do a lot so let's uh, let's explain a little bit more on that so if we go uh, yeah one step deeper again uh, back to our waveform if we want to process it through the neural network we'll have again to do this uh, this uh, segmentation of the of the waveform and take the take this small frame take the short-time Fourier transform to get the spectra and send it to the neural network to be processed. Then the neural network will predict that, uh, well, let's say this power spectrum uh, has some clean speech so that would be represented by these uh, high values here. And we'll have some noise which is represented by these low values. And you will uh, then send this filter uh, to resynthesize the signal. And, and you can do that uh, frame by frame uh, at, a, at a relatively uh, high rate. So that would be uh, how it works. And you rinse and repeat this same operation. Uh, a few numbers uh, also to, to talk about uh, the latencies that I mentioned earlier, that uh, in most of our product, we use the length of the frame is between 128 sample and uh, 512, which gives us a latency of the of the yeah of the Fourier uh, processing of around uh, eight between sorry between eight milliseconds and thirty two milliseconds, uh, and we have to let's say classify if I dare to say uh, uh, between sixty five and two hundred fifty seven uh, bins uh, per frame, um, so that's around uh, 60, uh, 60 times two hundred fifty seven let's say operation or prediction per uh, second. Uh, well, so now if you know exactly and you are experts in how to, to use uh, AI for speech enhancement, uh, I can talk a little bit about the, the training step. Uh, because there is an interesting point that uh, Torben mentioned is that, well, we, we need a good loss. Uh, so usually we send a lot of uh, training data to a neural network that will predict uh, the expected output. This output is not perfect, so you will you try to, to compare and you will try to compute some, some metrics that will uh, predict the speech quality or that will predict some values that, that are linked, correlated to speech quality. And um, you compare that with the clean speech and you, you try to evaluate, well, how good am I doing at the moment? Uh, and this loss function is, is really, really important. If, if a company comes out with a, a mathematical way to, 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 to compute uh, speech quality or to have uh, speech quality measures, uh, they really have a uh, struck gold and uh, they should send a lot of patents uh, there. And when you, have a, when you have a good idea on how good you do, you can use a stochastic grade and descent to update your network. And that's, uh, let's say, in a nutshell, that's how how it works. Uh, well, let's uh, listen to how it sounds. So going back to my previous example of, on the three different devices, uh, let's hear how the, let's say a neural network almost ready uh, for production would, would sound like. And the people sought to overthrow the government. Then Napoleon was called on to protect the palace of the Tuileries where the offices of the French government were located. So that would be the noisy reference and let's listen to the process. And the people sought to overthrow the government. Then Napoleon was called on to protect the palace of the Tuileries where the offices of the French government were located. So there's still a little bit of, uh, of noise popping in. Uh, it's a very transient sound of uh, you, you could hear like um, some uh, glassware being uh, struck, etc. that are quite difficult to remove. Uh, let's jump to directly to the, to the earbuds, which are very, let's say, difficult example. And the people sought to overthrow the government. Then Napoleon was called on to protect the palace of the Tuileries, where the offices of the French government were located. And let's listen to the process. And the people sought to overthrow the government. Then Napoleon was called on to protect the palace of the Tuileries, where the offices of the French government were located. So you could hear a lot more. Uh artifacts and also that even at some point the voice was almost uh, cut off so this is very very bad for 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 our, our system we don't want to cut the voice of the user so still some work to do but there are some uh, some these are some nice uh, illustration on, on how much can be done with uh, with these systems so now to open up a little bit the, the discussion and and uh, uh, it's really that uh, in, in our view, as in Jabra, ML is, is just a, a tool that needs to be used in conjunction with a traditional approach. Uh, we have uh, 
many years of experience with a traditional DSP and AI is a new kid on the block. And I mean, it should just all be combined to, to improve the end-to-end the -end, uh, speech quality. Uh, there are also some possibilities to, to use uh, other sensors uh, and modalities. Uh, we are also in, in the communication business and we have webcams, so why not using also video cues uh, in order to improve the speech quality? Um, and also, uh, well, could we also improve in terms of uh, data simulation? Uh, Torben mentioned that, well, you, you have to record a lot of data, uh, but we have very good models also on the acoustics, uh, on how acoustics works. And, and maybe we could simulate a re realistic environment so that the neural network can be trained on, on, the, on this data uh, without needing to constantly record new data for the neural network. Um, and let's say some of the challenges are still that it's very difficult to evaluate speech quality. So some some pointers towards uh, maybe crowd mass where you could crowdsource uh, actual uh, humans uh, evaluations that could be a, let's say a good way forward, but it's still slow. Uh, or maybe a DNS mass, so it's uh, AI driven uh, quality me measurements. Uh, this is also promising, and Microsoft is doing a, a lot of, of work on that. And finally, uh, and I think uh, Niels will uh, touch base there, is that there's still a lot of work to integrate uh, this AI approach in, in small chip. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of hard work that, uh, that needs to be done. So yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Clement. Do we have any questions or comments? Anything from you, Nielsen, Tom, before we move on? Yes, I think that uh, I think it's very interesting this about the crowd moss and all this. And, and as you also said, it's slow. You need you need somebody to listen to a file and then evaluate it so that you have metadata on it. And, and this is for sure worth following up that that has also happened to the question to pictures i mean uh, you send out pictures to people and then you have people uh, how many doctors is in the picture how many cats you know there's a lot of things going on so why not also for audio and then uh, a question about the uh, I, I think the metadata clement uh, maybe a question on that one what is the most what is the most low hanging fruit that you can see is it is it video combined image with audio or what do you see uh, no, I, I don't. I don't think so. Uh, video. Uh, it is difficult, right? Because uh, these video network are beast in terms of uh, of compute. So if you want to integrate that, it means a big chipset, etc. So yeah, it. Uh, I mean, it's it's a possibility if you if you have a lot of compute. Uh, maybe what I would see is uh, things related, for example, to. Uh, to a bone conduction microphones or other ways to pick up the sound uh, um, in, in let's say there's a way sound is produced uh, and and this would be a, this, would, this would be more promising um, but of course it's still still an open question on, on how to do that you you can do a lot with just a good microphone array and beam forming as you as you mentioned previously so yeah a, a sensor could also be that the user itself give you feedback that it does a good job somehow but we don't want to bother the user. But I'm I'm thinking also in that direction. You know, I, are you happy about the result? And then ask the real user. And if we somehow could manage that and get some feedback, that would be really really awesome. But uh, that is also a little bit how to do that without annoying them. I can mm -hmm. see there's questions sticking mm -hmm. in. Uh, Shelly is yes, there are three. So from Espen, is the phase of the original audio generally lost in the processing? Uh, no, so the, the, the original uh, phase is, is actually used, so the noisy phase is used to resynthesize uh, the, the signal in this time varying filter that I approach that I, that I uh, presented before. Um, and that's also, well, uh, could we do something better about uh, phase processing? That's also uh, interesting, especially, especially when you're working with the short uh, frames uh, where you, you only have a few uh, bins uh, to, to like the very short filters. So, well, if you're not doing something with the phase, you will create uh, some artifacts. So there are also some avenues there that could be, uh, that could be uh, interesting to, to look into. Thank you. Okay, next from Jean-Baptiste. When getting noisy data for training, is it always better to mix clean data with noisy data so that you have control on the amount of noise brought in? Or do you see cases 
when you would want to record data and noise altogether? Yep. Uh, very good question. Uh, well, the, the the thing is, for training, you need to have some sort of, of clean reference, or at least with the metrics that we have for for our loss function, is that you need to have a, a clean reference. Um, what I can say uh, is that uh, we've seen some interesting uh, development in in ways to compute speech quality without a reference. You could you could have a, an idea of uh, how good uh, the speech sound without the need of the, the clean speech uh, reference and using some AI uh, approaches. And this allows you to just record any noisy uh, signal to process it through a neural network. The neural network will create an enhanced file. And then you could process that with this uh, neural network speech prediction to, to improve the speech quality. And, and we've seen paper at, uh, at InterSpeech this year uh, exactly doing that. So, so a bunch of interesting literature on that that could be done, but let's say usually with what's uh, what's available, uh, uh, not not in the latest paper. It's it's usually better to have clean reference. It's it helps a lot. Great. Maybe that's a, a link you could share with us, and we'll send it out afterwards with a with the email. Yep. Thanks. So from Lars Christensen, how many parameters are used in the NN used for the noise suppression examples? So this one is uh, 800,000 weights, uh, and we have, let's say, varying uh, example of, let's say, similar network with uh, between um, uh, 2.4, uh, sorry, 240,000 uh, weights up to, uh, you know, sky is the limit there. But uh, let's say we try to stop at uh, around a few million parameters because then it gets very far out of uh, what can be possible in, in the chipset. Try to stop. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, okay, from Sebastian, is Jabra investing in AI for other applications than noise reduction? Yeah, we are. We are. I, I would say. I mean, is that we are trying to AI is is a tool that we are trying to to use in many other fields. So, I mean, noise reduction is one, but you have uh, um, echo control, you have uh, environment classification, uh, you have. Uh, I mean, uh, it's just a, a new tool that that give very good results and that needs to be uh, investigated. I would say. Sorry, I was muted. Thanks a lot, um, yep. Clément. Thank you. I think that's all the questions for now. Excellent. Oh, one more. Have we got time? Two more. OK, we might have to come back to these ones at the end if we have a bit of time. Yes. Um, so let's move over to, to Nils Henrik Potopidan. Uh Nils manages research for, for Odecon at the Ericsholm Research Center. And he has a, a PhD from DTU Compute, and he started working with voice separation already during his master's thesis in 2001. So this is not a new topic for him. I don't know if he's only been working with this uh, <laughs> since then, um, but we're happy to have him here today. And he's gonna speak about uh, separating voices for, with AI for super low power platforms, which I assume means hearing aids in this case. Yes, it uh, does. You are absolutely right, uh, Shelley. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, and thanks to Tolman and uh, Clement for some really good uh, talks uh, before here, which also uh, actually that's the benefit of being the last one. There's a lot of explanation that I do not have uh, to do. Um, and yes, um, I started I started with this uh, 20 years ago and we'll get back to this and I've been I have been doing other things uh, meanwhile too but and we'll not dwell into this. So the first thing is that I would really like to first acknowledge that what I'm talking about today is not something that uh, I have been doing myself. I have had a number of collaborators at the Tampere University that we were collaborating with and then um, colleagues at Odecon and then also um, if we go 20 years back um, Mass Durham that I started uh, doing this master thesis with. But let's just get into what this is. And I'm going to step a little bit uh, further out than uh, compared to what the Torben and uh, Clement uh, were talking about. So I, I will talk about uh, the research and, and, and so I will not give you any examples of anything that is uh, in a product right now, not something that will uh, come in a product, but more something where we are trying to explore um, the uh, the sky the limit for uh, some really really difficult uh, problems that 
we see uh, in, in our uh, business. And just some uh, background, uh, like if we go back uh, 20 years, there were uh, several methods proposed for separating voices. And I, I'm only uh, mentioning a few uh, here. So that's the factorial hidden Markov models that came out in a paper by Sam Robas at the uh, Neuroinformation Processing Systems Conference, NIPS, back in 2000. That was back then when NIPS and the AI conference was a fairly small conference, two or 300 dedicated people, the outcasts that were still focusing on um, machine machine learning and uh, AI where everybody else was doing something else. Um, there, uh, and then there was also the independent component analysis um, uh, work that happened in that same period and, and, and do it. And all of these were computational heavy. Um, they could separate voice uh, energy, but they were nowhere near anything that could improve uh, intelligibility uh, in noise. And also, let's face it, what people were looking into back then was it was mainly technical research. It was going into what can the technology uh, achieve and, and some, some numbers, but it was not close to being put into a reality. This was not something um, where you wanted to test it with the, with the test persons. And, have uh, people listening to it and and to rate it that would that would was simply not worth it because uh, you could hear okay it's doing something it is dragging something out but it would uh, it would not uh, provide any improvement that you could use for anything at all so it was really uh, a fairly technical uh, and far from uh, the reality kind of research that happened back then um, and then uh, in in the um, Moving from uh, where we were 20 years ago uh, to where we are today, um, I joined uh, the Ericsson Research Center uh, some 16 uh, years uh, ago. And what we are doing uh, and, uh, and, um, and where we actually use AI is that we are looking heavily into uh, trying to um, uncover and understand the problems that people have uh, when they have a hearing loss. And, uh, and then we are also trying to uh, see if there uh, are some um, underlying causes in the hearing loss that we perhaps could compensate. And we're looking into also the technology that will come in the next 5, 10, 15 years and trying to predict how can this help us? How can we also create some uh, early uh, proof of concept studies um, that, uh, that help us understand this and also gives us a, some kind of idea if, if the technology will, uh, will uh, help us. So um, the problem that we're looking at um, in, in this respect here is that uh, when you're in a situation uh, where there are competing voices and that can be uh, family dinners, but it can also be the famous cocktail parties, people with hearing loss, they struggle to understand what's being said. And they also struggle to understand who said uh, what. So it's, um, you just take two voices and add them on top of uh, each other. Uh, and then it's, uh, it's problematic for people uh, with a hearing loss. And the question that we put to ourselves um, back five, seven, eight uh, years ago was, can AI improve um, performance uh, in this kind of situation? Is this a possible way for us uh, moving forward? So uh, basically, uh, this is a super, super old idea. Uh, can we enhance segregation? And segregation means that you have a better understanding of uh, what uh, person one is saying, uh, person uh, two is saying, but uh, you have it at the same time. You, as a listener, you are able uh, to uh, have a mental picture or have this as a two uh, in independent uh, objects. Uh, and we were trying to investigate if we could create a mono to stereo um, algorithm with AI that would be good enough so that when you present it out here to the sides, you get a clear picture, you get a clear stream, it's more clear um, what uh, each uh, of these two uh, people uh, are saying. So that was where, that was where we were heading. And, and um, so we were trying to do a spatial uh, augmentation. So we had an AI algorithm uh, to separate voices into two. And of course you should perhaps in the future, try to uh, add more channels and, and also add more uh, sources in the beginning. Having something that uh, increases the spatial contrast, like moves it up. And, uh, and then also uh, 
be a bit realistic and um, at least have a look at, okay, what happens when you uh, interfere uh, with uh, the similarity of the audio and the image, because uh, this is a hearing device. Uh, it's, not, it's not a set of uh, goggles. So we are not going to uh, make a visual distinction between the two uh, people, but we are having two people in front of you and then we're going to augment uh, the audio. We're create, creating this artificial stereo and it should still work. People should not become seasick or find that this is uh, odd. Um, we bet, we haven't tested it yet, that uh, the visual cues will simply override the uh, auditory cues. And uh, so it will just be the, like venture lists that uh, confuse you with uh, just putting a hand out here and then minimizing their own um, mouth movements and then moving the hands and then it works. We hope that works for us too, but we haven't tested it yet. So, um, uh, now this is a fairly busy chart and it uh, just uh, shows uh, what um, what uh, Clemang also uh, showed uh, before. Let me just get my laser pointer. So uh, basically uh, our uh, training was that we would take some sources and we would take two uh, different uh, voices and we would uh, create a mixture of them. And we would uh, give that to the DNN training. We would also give the same uh, two sources, but clean uh, and put that into the DNN training. And then we are uh, teaching uh, the uh, deep neural network uh, basically to create a sieve, uh, a mask, one mask that filters out one uh, voice and another mask that filters out uh, another voice. So here you already see a little bit that how, how we put a uh, put the AI into a place in a different way than uh, uh, that Clement and uh, Tom just did, because Clement and Tom, they were, uh, they were having um, one spectrogram, which is uh, the target uh, of interest. And then there's another spectrogram, which is basically the noise. And that is not necessarily uh, reconstructed, but we are uh, trying to reconstruct both signals because we, again, we want to make a mono to stereo, um, algorithm and we want to uh, enhance the, the 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 scene with this so that you have better access uh, to to both of them but that's so that was just what we tried uh, to uh, achieve so uh, then uh, when um, when you uh, apply it and uh, are done with the training uh, it should be so simple that you could just take a mixture um, of uh, some uh, speech utterances that you have not seen before uh, do the feature extraction. That's the uh, short time Fourier transform that uh, the man also showed. Then you get the mixture spectrogram. You feed this uh, uh, mixture spectrogram into the deep neural network. And the deep neural network here is then actually capable of um, predicting the two uh, masks on a frame by frame, uh, major, uh, frame by frame um, time horizon, uh, not looking too much ahead in the future because we also need to uh, keep the latency down. And then you get a cleaned up spectrogram of voice one and you get a cleaned up spectrogram of uh, voice two. And basically we uh, worked with uh, um, feature extraction. So the short time Fourier transforms that we were working with that could support a latency down to eight milliseconds. And these uh, eight milliseconds is um, not considering how fast the deep neural network could uh, estimate the, 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 bi the binary or the uh, ratio masks. So it's only the, um, the signal processing delay. But we wanted to see if, can we actually, uh, can we actually uh, use uh, spectrograms uh, of this short duration uh, and still get it uh, to work? And then we will leave it to our clever colleagues uh, who do the uh, development of products to actually and make the, uh, um, the application of the deep neural network fast enough so that would uh, work out for us. So um, just give you a, some examples. The he broke his ties with groups of former friends. So this was uh, listening and uh, listening to how uh, they hear two voices now it's separated. The he broke his ties with groups of former friends. And then you can focus uh, on just one voice. 
He broke his ties with groups of former friends. The leaves turned brown and dry. So, and I know that I ran through these audio examples uh, fairly uh, fairly quickly, but you can uh, refer to the uh, recording if you want to uh, listen uh, to them uh, more uh, carefully. But if we uh, if we sort of start uh, the, the first thing that you heard, that was when the two signals were presented uh, together. Uh, people with hearing loss they uh, they understand uh, fifty percent of the, uh, of the words, and then. Um, when we uh, do the deep neural um, segregation of the uh, audio, we can bring uh, the speech intelligibility from 50% uh, to 60, 65. Um, and just for reference, and you can uh, look in the, the paper that I that my uh, colleague Lars Bramsu was the first author on in JASA from 2018. We also had uh, the ideal uh, situation. So if you just Play the two clean voices uh, out there, uh, you could have get, gotten to uh, like 75%. So that was uh, the yardstick for uh, how good we could actually improve it if we had a really, really good uh, separation algorithm. And then up here in the top, uh, you have the um, performance that normal hearing listeners have. So you can see, uh, even though we, uh, when we uh, provide the best separation possible, which is the clean voices, People with hearing loss still have problems. They're not as good, but we are moving people away from the 50% point and, and into the 60s. Uh, and this is actually a, a this is an improvement that would be a benefit for people with hearing loss. And probably we will uh, try to improve it uh, before this uh, reaches a, a product. But um, the um, other interesting aspects of this is that uh, the deep neural networks that we had uh, in here, the, um, the uh, forward uh, deep neural networks, they had around uh, 4 million uh, weights uh, and we were operating at a 200 Hertz audio frame uh, processing rate. So uh, it's um, in, in, in terms of uh, signal processing on a hearing uh, device that has a one milliwatt power budget, uh, it's a bit over the top. Let's just put it like this. Um, so, um, so that's of course a little bit out in the future. However, if you look into uh, some of the communities that are looking uh, uh, that are dealing with um, machine learning uh, on the edge, so that's uh, it's not just uh, for hearing aids; it's for all kind of small battery-powered uh, devices in the future, and this is the tiny machine learning. Uh, community, you can actually see that you have a lot of uh, vendors, uh, and that's both established uh, vendors like uh, actually IBM, uh, and up uh, upcoming vendors, uh, and also those upcoming vendors that already have been bought by some of the bigger companies. They do offer AI uh, co-processors that um, that just let's put it this way: they approach the above requirements, and also the power budget gets closer and closer to hearing applications. Actually, um, when you go to the tiny ML community, sometimes the, uh, the processing uh, or the battery power that we require for a hearing aid is really uh, in the high end of the spectrum because there are also other applications where people want to put uh, out a intelligent uh, sensor out in the forest and it should uh, smell uh, for um, for uh, fires uh, in the forest, and you want to put it out there, and then you want to have it to run uh, five, uh, ten years on the same uh, tiny, tiny, tiny uh, battery. So they are uh, closer to 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 microwatts uh, in their application. So that was a fun thing of being a huge power uh, user. Um, a little bit also, what uh, what are the next uh, uh, steps? Because what we uh, um, uh, did here was that we actually, uh, and I will get back to that, we tried to say, okay, we want to understand if AI can help us in this, uh, with this problem. Uh, we are not going to solve everything with AI first. So we are going to make a fairly narrow uh, demonstration uh, and see if we can uh, get this to work. So we started by 
having AI learning to separate known voices. So um, it would be my voice and somebody else's voice, and we would learn, uh, we would train on the, these two voices. Then we will create new mixtures of those two voices, and we try to separate that. But of course, of course going out in, um, in, in real life, you would like to have AI learning just to separate uh, voices so that it, it does not need to know the voices uh, beforehand. And uh, if you uh, look into what uh, what uh, the Google uh, audio uh, signal processing uh, group have, uh, has done, um, then there is a significant number of, uh, of uh, papers uh, on that uh, too. So um, if we just uh, leave that and, and, and start thinking about um, what is it that uh, you should do if you are sitting with, uh, with your idea or uh, your uh, company and you're trying to see, okay, how can I use or should I use AI for uh, audio um, uh, digital signal processing? It's, it's really about identifying a key problem. Uh, you should also make sure that it's uh, difficult enough, but you should also make sure that it's tractable. So don't uh, put in AI uh, to uh, create a time machine or something like that. Um, then, um, because this is a little bit different uh, compared to what, uh, what we are usually uh, doing uh, in the past where we try to analyze a problem and then we try to uh, invent an algorithm and we would uh, specify and we would program uh, the steps uh, that you need to go through. We will create a flow chart where you have these uh, steps and uh, then you will do uh, feature extraction and then you will do uh, enhancement of this and here you will do enhancement of this. No, um, when you uh, work uh, with AI, you are, you are, it's more like defining the training material, um, the, the tasks that needs to be trained uh, and the metric. And if you, um, this was also something that Tom and uh, uh, Clement uh, went into uh, the metric, um, Basically, um, we have some metrics that we can use for, uh, for training uh, AI models, uh, but these metrics are not necessarily 100% representative of, uh, of the benefit. So um, I, I don't think that I share too many uh, trade secrets uh, here by saying that the um, algorithm that the DNN algorithm that we had in our JSA uh, paper in 2018 that was not our first incarnation of the, the deep neural networks. We had been through a number of, um, of um, topologies where we could uh, measure benefits uh, in, in, the, in the metrics, like in the SNR, the SDR, and what, uh, what have you not. But when we tested it on uh, hearing impaired listeners, it did not uh, provide a benefit. So uh, again, uh, as Clement said, the, the person that would have a really, really good, or the company that have a really, really good metric, they will actually uh, become, uh, that would be very powerful. And then also define a sequence uh, of constraints uh, to be lifted so that you do not try to, uh, to solve uh, everything in one go. And I'm just uh, here listing a, a number of the things that, uh, that we had as our sequence of uh, constraints to be lifted. Um, so, um, so again, um, some of the things that uh, you could be talking about and uh, discussing in your companies is what is your key challenge, what data uh, to use to solve the key challenge, and also trying to understand uh, if you have the uh, skill sets in your company to actually uh, lift the task. And, uh, and with that, uh, thanks uh, for uh, attending. Thank you very much, Niels. That was very interesting. Um, I was wondering, I know you're measuring um, percentage um, speech intelligibility or how, the percentage of words that could be understood, but do you also measure um, cognitive load or other other parameters? Uh, yes, we have we have been uh, trying uh, trying with that and and we um, we were basically able to see uh, in a in, in a little uh, a sub study, that um, so it was not the effort, but this was then the uh, the, uh, the speech envelopes uh, in the uh, auditory cortex, and we could see how this processing um, actually facilitated that uh, both uh, 
both the both the signals uh, had a better uh, encoding, um, but but we haven't published anything on the uh, listening effort. And I think uh, this is also a, a problem when you are listening to two uh, two, uh, two people speaking at the same time. It's a it's a fairly complex uh, situation uh, too, uh, and perhaps um, we would say uh, the you can go for two things, and this is where we will need to figure out. Uh, for some people, uh, the, the, the optimal processing would be that you actually just focus on one and you attenuate uh, the other. And there would be uh, certain types of hearing loss, but that's the only thing that you can do. And then there are other people where you can do the scene uh, or the enhanced segregation. And uh, we still have some far, uh, some way to go uh, before we know, know that. And also great for people who aren't hearing impaired and have to be in conference calls all day and yeah, it can get quite tiring. It would be nice to have everybody separated out and maybe oh, matching yes. the, the video. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, let's be honest, I'm doing this technology for myself. <laughs> Sometimes it's my future self, but it's, uh, it's, it's for myself as well. Yeah, <laughs> the you in 20 years time. Um, do you have any questions, Torben or Nils? Oh, sorry, Torben or Clement, sorry. If I can go for a quick one, uh, Nils. Uh, then uh, how much could, let's say, would it be possible then to train a, a binaural neural network for, for doing the similar task or then then you come into the, you know, as soon as you have more microphone, you open the can of warm of, uh, you know, data simulation, etc. So is it something that you have looked at or what, what's your thought on, on this? Oh, that is uh, that is a really, really good uh, uh, question, uh, Kavan. And um, we, um, we actually um, selected the, the single channel uh, to begin with because we could see that uh, if you have two people in front of you, uh, then um, the likelihood that we will have uh, some microphone arrays in the hearing devices soon that we will be able to separate them out, that will that will not uh, that that's that's not there. But we are more looking into uh, then if you then have uh, a um, if you have a two hearing aids or two um, two hearables uh, or two heads uh, headsets, if they were then like uh, could uh, choose different models uh, and when i say different models i'm uh, saying can they choose different um, voice models so that uh, like your left ear piece would uh, focus on uh, and, and choose a model that um, is aligned with a, a source to the left of you and uh, the same would uh, happen on your right hand side the right hand side device would choose a model that is adapted to a sound source uh, from the right. I think it's more uh, more in that direction uh, we ha have been uh, looking. And then we also had a power constraint. So I think we were more thinking about uh, thinking that we would prefer to uh, perhaps put that this after uh, the, uh, the beam forming uh, to keep the processing uh, down. But this is this is where we can play. This is also where we can compete. Mm -hmm. I need can I ask a uh, question to, into that, Kelly? Yes, yes, you may. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, but, but because bidirectional, I also I I also got like you know using both sides at the same time with the head, the shadow effect of the head and everything. Uh, and and then uh, then uh, I think one of the problems is also today, maybe not in the future, the bandwidth. I mean, maybe they need to talk together I, I, in order to do that filtering. And if you cannot live with all samples talk together, then then we need a, a, to find a downscaled model that can communicate or something like that. So I guess uh, there would be some things to do. Yeah, I, I probably already said too much about the bilateral because then it's a just uh, exchanging parameters on uh, which kind of uh, voice that you are uh, zooming in on on uh, each side. But well, I think that's it's fairly obvious uh, once you uh, spend a few few hours with this uh, technology. Mm. Yeah. Most there questions out there from the community? There are no more questions. What? 
what i know <laughs> but we're also just about out of time so we'll have to to wrap it up for today anyways um so thank you all three of you for your your great presentations i certainly learned a lot um and that i don't always whenever people get into complex stuff so that was yeah really interesting for me um and i'm sure everyone in the audience enjoyed it as well um yeah so before we go i would just like to say that the best audio event of the year after this one is happening in two weeks um and that's danish sound day and it will take place in copenhagen so if you haven't bought your ticket there are a few left um and yeah please just take 30 seconds to fill out the questionnaire after the call um we are we want to continue putting on these events and improving them so uh we would love your feedback if you could just take a moment to do that and yeah thanks thanks everyone for being here and we will send out the the presentations and some links afterwards as well thanks very much Torben, Klima, and Niels thank you Bye. Have a nice Bye -bye. Day. thank you